about this attachment to thinking. Uh, if there is uh, no thinking, no form and no meaning, and we try to keep clear mirror-like mind, uh, is it possible to keep it all the time? Like, I have the feeling that we need some kind of, let's say, operational personality just to, I don't know, take a shower. Because if you're not thinking, it's not possible to plan the stages, actually. Like, should of we course also you need that operational it? personality, and we have one. If you do not believe that this is absolute, if you do not believe that this is very special, if you don't make a discrimination between you and the others, this operational personality is very, very useful. If you say you have a special eye, you're mistaken, and the stick will hit you 30 times. If you say you have no eye, also mistake, and the stick will hit you 30 times. So actually, I very much like the term operational personality. Very important. But when you don't do anything, then there is no personality. We call that Wu Wei in Chinese. So non-action means no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No past, no present, no future. No good, no bad. Then this operational personality does not exist. It doesn't come into being. But when you see, when you hear, when you taste, smell, touch, think, feel, speak, and act, then you have this operational personality we call Anna. And we need that. Otherwise, who can take responsibility for your own actions and speech and feelings, etc.? But how this operational personality exists, how it comes into being and how it disappears, now that's a big insight that we should all have. And if most people on this earth had that insight, we would cause way less suffering to each other and ourselves. This insight contains three important marks. One is impermanence. This is something most of us cannot face, not even when we are old, that this operational personality, this body and mind together, that's impermanent. Deep inside, secretly, we all want to live forever. And we believe that somehow there is an exception from the rules. And by the time this body gets old, there will be some special technology from up or down that kind of prolongs life or can make you escape the shock of death, okay? So impermanence is number one. It makes your whole personality and whole experience of reality relative instead of absolute. Next is interdependence. We love freedom. We love freedom so much that we forget about the other person or persons or the world. So this freedom, that's okay, but how much we depend on each other and this world, we sometimes forget that. So can you be free from oxygen more than five minutes? Yeah, you can, but then this life stops as we know it, you know? So independence is great, but interdependence makes it very relative, okay? And imperfection is the other, the third. So we believe we are so finite, we are so great because we can do this, we can think this way, we can feel that. Our body has this shape or that shape and is capable of this and that. So we believe that this is some kind of non plus ultra perfection, okay? When you look at the great work of art, it appears perfect because it seems that nothing can be added and nothing can be taken away without violating the integrity of that work of art. And this is true, but perfection is not true. In terms of ourselves, as a continuum, as an entity, you can always add some more or take away some personality traits, some characteristics, so you can change. This operational personality is operational because it can change. And this change has the three marks of existence, impermanence, interdependence, and imperfection. Now, if you see that, your fixed notion of ego is gone. And that's why we fight so much against this. 
Because we want to see ourselves as some absolute little entity that we can fight everything and everyone. We can defy the law of cause and effect, etc., etc. So operational personality is good, but before that, out of necessity, you have to come back to no personality. We call that don't know. And once you have that, even for a moment, your whole worldview changes. Then your karma becomes something you can handle. Then your path becomes something you can believe in and you can walk. And that's very important because with the absolute notion of self, we have the biggest hindrance ever. And that's the source of our suffering. Uh, would you please uh, clear one point about interdependence? Uh, what I want to uh, ask about is um, uh, if we uh, assume that uh, the whole world is created by mind alone. Why would you assume that? You heard it somewhere? Yeah. <laughs> Don't believe these Buddhist sentences. Okay. Yeah, but what is this mind? Tell me. Exactly, this is my question. Like, it inter intertwines somehow with what you uh, said just recently. Because the mind I experienced at first, like, of course, it's my own mind. So, how not to fall into solipsism and how to see the interdependence if I believe that reality is my creation? How do I experience other being as You being? identify this mind with you. That's the problem. So, so this mind is only Anna, nobody else. I mean, we have at least 20 more people in this room who can claim the same thing. So we have 20 different versions of mind. Which one is the creator? And if every one of them is, then to what extent? So if you bog down yourself, as an individual mind, now that's a huge problem. Very serious limitation. Yeah, we are part of it. Human beings, we have 7.3 billion human beings on this earth and we create this earth, this whole world. And your part is one per 7.3 billion. So where's the boundary of that mind? Where is the location of that mind? Now, that's our search. If you say that I, my, me is you, or that mind is you, uh, then there is more practice to be done. Okay? Okay, thank you. Good. I believe that um, according to Zen, our true self, our true nature, does not have any gender. So my question is, why did we, from some point, start to sit separately, uh, like there is a row, row for a male and for women? Like, isn't it creating unnecessary commotion and distinction? Actually, your true nature has no gender, but your body has. What does it change? Why do we have to sit separately? Because it does not create commotion. If you did sit, you know, together, then you would look way more left and right and try to measure your level of interaction with the other gender. This really takes that out of the picture and helps women feel the female energy and males feel the male energy together as a group. And I think this is a really important experience. And then outside you do whatever you want. So this is not a limitation, it's a practicality, so that we would deal with meditation and really meditation only. I sat in many, many ways. You know, when I was a layman, uh, we sat completely mixed in Europe and in America. In Asia, as a monk, I sat with monks, nuns on the other side of the room, but sometimes we sat with laymen on the same side and nuns with laywomen, depending on the kind of people we had. And it was really, really an important experience. And uh, when I was head monk at Huagyasa, sometimes I had to walk around with the stick, the stick that you could ask to be hit with on your back if it was hurting. And when we sat in this separate way in the Asian style, then you could really feel the difference as you walked slowly from one part of the room to the other. 
Now, for me, that was a really strong realization that this is male energy, this is female energy. And unless you group people together, they do not have that experience. So energetically, what it means to be a man, energetically, what it means to be a woman, it's a very good teaching, not at the cognitive or emotional level, but just sitting together and experience that. When I uh, decided that we would go with the traditional forms, I also adopted the way they do it in Asia. That has some wisdom. That has some really good experience. That you do not create this kind of male-female vibes by sitting close together. Even if you don't want it, it's there. So these are the vibes that we consciously do not deal with during meditation. You turn that energy inside and inwards. If not, it gets immediately kind of polarized between males and females. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it, this is not what this room is about. That's why I say, you go outside, have fun. In this place, we consciously distinguish so that you could have a very much unified experience, mentally, energetically, etc. And uh, that seems to be useful. Uh, I would like to, uh, to go back to the pig and uh, choosing reincarnation. Uh, like as uh, for, for a kind of new person here, I have the question about reincarnation in general. Wonderful. Uh, here we, like, we practice. And for me it seems to be a huge gap between uh, just practicing, clearing your mind, and in believing in karma, reincarnation, choosing your future incarnation, and so on and so on. My question is, do you get the knowledge about all of this at some point if you meditate very hard? Or where does this knowledge come from? Have you seen old water mills? Surely. Good. There's this huge wheel. And there is the stream. Usually the stream is kind of artificially conducted to drive the wheel. So about 5 to 10% of the wheel is in the water. And the water is fast and strong enough to drive it around. And the power is transmitted to the building and then to the stones, etc., etc. Now, does the mill drive the water? Or the water drives the mill? The water drives the mill. Yeah, but what drives the water? Uh, probably gravitation. What drives gravitation? Um, the mass of the planet. What generated the mass of the planet? We're not sure about it, but light... Uh, no, sorry, black matter, probably. Light and dark matter, that's what yeah. you... Okay, no, so, dark, actually. Um, so let's, let's get back to the Big Bang, my favorite dozens. area. What happened before the Big Bang? Do you know that? Uh, there was a... How to say it in English? Um, oh, I'm really interested because nobody knows. No, there, okay, <laughs> I, I, I was trying just to say the most uh, widespread theory. It's... Uh, Whoa, I just don't know how to say it in English. And kind of entity. Uh, like the very, very big mass, huge mass. That's it's called singularity. Exactly. Yeah, but what was before the singularity? I don't know. Good. Now your soul, your being, we call Anna, is reacting with the world pretty much like the water mill and the water, right? So what drives your soul? The external world or something deeper inside? I don't know. That was fast. Because if you want to find the source of reincarnation, you should know what drives your soul, what makes it into a being. Where your whole being comes from. Is that the world just conditioning it into something? Because then you're like a machine, like a, like a mill. And the way you are spinning around depends on the creek, on gravity, 
on the planets, on the Big Bang, on the observable universe. Why? Because the mill does not have a mind. This wheel does not know that it's a wheel. We do. We say I. We say human. We say light and dark. Life and death. So there is something in us that can perceive that. Now, if you attain that, you have control over reincarnation. If you don't attain that, then you're just like a water mill, the big wheel going around, sometimes wet, sometimes dry, sometimes in the water, sometimes up in the air. If the wheel wanted to stop itself, it would have to go to the very center of it where it doesn't move, where the axle is. And if you stop the axle, then the whole wheel stops. Okay? So here you find the central element, the very center of your being. And if you find that, we call that not moving mind. Also the mind beyond life and death. The mind beyond becoming anything. And if you attain that, you have control over reincarnation. So again, why ask about what other people think about it? It can be useful. But rather, look inside what it is that generates life in you. What is it that generates the new body in you? Where do your thoughts, feelings, perceptions, impulses, forms of consciousness come from? Now you find that source, you find the source of everything. And then you have a choice. You have a choice whether you are born or not. Whether you are born female or male. Polish, Hungarian, American, Swahili, or Urdu. Your choice. If you look at the Mahayana structure of the observable and the invisible, then you see that there are six realms of existence. Humans and animals are in the very center. Demigods and gods are above. Demons and hell are below. Consider this, just certain aspects of the same frequency range, okay? Various parts, various segments of the same range. You can ascend and descend. You can go from one place to another and then another depending on your karma. You make human karma, you get human body. Why? Because your mind is human. You make animal karma, you get animal body because your mind became an animal, etc., etc. But there is a threshold above the six realms. We call it the threshold of life and death. If you become sufficiently enlightened, then you get to the upper four realms, that is Pratyeka Buddhas, Shravakas, Bodhisattvas, and Buddhas. Shravakas are the listeners, those who are listening. Pratyeka Buddhas are those who make their own effort to attain enlightenment. Bodhisattvas are those who are still returning to any incarnated state to help all beings. And Buddhas never incarnate anymore. They are there purely in a mental state. And then, even from there, they can reach everything and everyone. So, the four and the six, we call this the ten directions or the ten realms. Why are these so important? Not because there are four or six below. You can divide them in any possible way you want, okay? But what is important is the threshold between them. That above the threshold you have freedom over life and death. You can choose because you reach that kind of clarity. And below that you have very little choice. Some have more, some have less. But the more karma you have, the heavier you are the more determined you are. The more identifications you have, the more predictable you are. If your ego is very strong, people can see it from a mile away. So it's really important to see this threshold. And that's why we say, attain this point, no thinking, no dualism, no I, then go beyond life and death. This is not a Zen fairy tale. This is a possible experience. And when you have that, then you have a choice. So whatever people say about this reincarnation, whatever they think about the wheel as it moves, as the water drives it, it's not the most important thing. 
The most important thing is what is it that makes it or unmakes it, okay? And if you make it, how do you make it? How you are reborn, if you are, okay? That's why we are practicing. Practicing means very, very clear and sometimes very tight form. Everything happens on time. Everything happens in a certain way. Everything is prescribed by an order. And it's a very conscious choice. Why? Because with this extremely conditioned existence, we want to reach something which is not conditioned, which is beyond existence, which is beyond life and death. And by alone, even this retreat is not enough for that. Your everyday life is necessary too. But if you don't do the retreat, for most of us, everyday life cannot be meaningful sufficiently so that we would wake up. We would just live, and that's okay. Billions of people do that. But do we wake up from our dreams? Do we wake up from our illusions in the meantime? That is the question. That's why the form. That's why the method. That's why the whole practice. So that we, by consciously giving up certain choices, small choices, we would have a big choice. And this big choice can be ours. It can be all of yours if we practice together. Okay? Okay, so um, putting it in other words, like this whole, like um, the acknowledgement of this structure lies within uh, the access of our direct experience if we practice. Yeah. 